Good morning, Jason here, Birchfield Family Farm, Oxford, Ohio. Good word today comes from John 6. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Okay, we got a beautiful day out here on the homestead today. It is heating up all the way around. We were pretty dry here, just got some rain, so that puts us back in the game on these uh, paddocks and watching out for uh, when we start our rotation. I want to talk today about meat birds. We have a hundred meat chickens on the way, going to be uh, arriving just about any minute. Uh, I want to take you over today, show you our brooder setup. I want to I want to talk uh, today just about these meat birds and uh, you know wh why we do it, uh, kind of the, the yield. Uh, 587 pounds of meat uh, that we got off of, I shouldn't say meat, just chicken in general, they're whole birds. Uh, but we process here on the farm, we do the entire process, but we, we do purchase the day old chicks and uh, do the brooder for two weeks, then get them out on pasture. You know, meat birds are really an essential part of what we do here, and it's a multifaceted benefit. It's not just about the meat, but we pick a paddock out here, and we run them on that paddock, and we get that, that manure, that fertilizer put down. It is a lot of fertilizer that goes on one of these paddocks, and you can definitely, definitely tell the difference um, in an area that we've been through uh, with that chicken tractor. So process, brooder, out to pasture, then up here uh, in the barn for our processing day. And uh, you know, 100 birds, we do batches of 100. And uh, like I say, 587 pounds of meat. Uh, the one year we had 100, and the hatchery usually gives you a couple extra. And we had 101 birds that year that made it through. Been doing this for four or five years now and uh, learned a thing or two. And so I wanna pass that along to you. Uh, this is a commercial uh, enterprise for us. We started out with uh, doing 20 or 25 uh, in town. Had the greenest greenest lawn in town, uh, that's for sure. There is a kind of a debate on, you know, whether or not to use uh, dual purpose chickens. We do use uh, Cornish cross uh, meat birds are called broilers. Uh, we do use those. We've done a comparison. We've tried raising other breeds and the results were we fed out twice as long as the Cornish and we got half of the weight. If you want meat, you want uh, lots of it, Cornish is uh, the way to go. It's worked for us, very healthy out on pasture. Wife takes the whole birds when we're done, uh, obviously cooks those in the crock, we've got the meat, but then she makes a bone broth with those when we're done, keeps us healthy here on the farm. We gave a lot of that away during COVID as well, helping other people get that gut health uh, back up and reset and, and optimized. And so we, I believe in what we do here. You guys know that. And uh, But I want to wanna take you around and uh, show you the arrival of these chicks and uh, show you how we're going to get these things going. Okay, so here's our, our brooder setup, part of our general chicken coop. But this area is separate. You can see probably a 20 foot long by maybe two and a half foot wide space here. Like to put wood chips down first and then go over that with sifted hay. So real fine hay seeds and such. And I find that that's really a superior bedding to any kind of like the pine shavings. And this brooder, it's called an Ohio brooder here. I realize we got a lot going on. I'll explain all that, but I got it on a, a half ton hoist, which is overkill. Gambrel here, just some ratchet straps. This thing has worked awesome for us though for probably five, six years now. Lower this whole box down and uh, it goes down and then the chicks can self-regulate temperature. We got a couple heat lamps under here and uh, the chicks can go in and out as they see fit. That's a metal top, a little bit of insulation on the sides there, try and keep the cobwebs cleaned out of this thing before we run it so nothing's uh, potentially catching on fire here. Uh, speaking of that, we use a, an Inkbird uh, thermostat here 
And uh, you know, I've tried a couple different thermostats and I always have the issue of the relay wants to stick. And uh, on an application like this, um, typically when you, you're heating, you have something called a high limit switch. And the high limit switch, when a relay sticks or something happens, that high limit will kick everything off when it, when it hits a high uh, temperature. On this here, we cannot install a high limit switch because then it cuts the heat out completely and we lose our chicks. They've got to stay hot, about 95 degrees in the beginning. And so what I've come up with is something called, uh, from a company called Yo, Yo Link, Y-O-L-I-N-K. That's one of their, their automated uh, plugs right there. So we got this thing on that and then we've got a sensor in here right there and what this is going to do is i can remotely monitor this temperature it sends me an alert uh, when this thing gets over uh, my parameters that i set and then what i can do is i can from my bed at night uh, this has happened at like three in the morning it throws the alarm phone goes off and then i can actually turn this outlet off and then back on from my bed and it resets this whole thing and resets the relay. Now, we're not over the wattage on this thing. I've tried other thermostats, they do the same thing. Um, I, have, I have upped the differential on this. So we're running about an eight degree differential. If I go much below that, it starts to stick. But again, using that Yo link, I'll link to both that plug and the sensor underneath. I'll link to those in the description. I'm not affiliated, it's just something that has worked for us. Saves me having to come out here, you know, at, at three or four in the morning. Uh, that's usually when this thing kicks out. Anyway, brooder set up. Uh, chicks should be here about any minute and we'll get them put in here. But this has worked very well for us. I'm a big fan of the Ohio brooder simply because it allows the chicks to come in and out and self-regulate uh, that temperature. When we get this thing down, then we can use this hoist to raise raise this whole thing you know as they grow we can raise it up typically spend about two weeks in here in the brooder uh, not having drafts is important so I love that uh, this coop has this you know concrete and wood walls on three sides uh, once the chicks get here keep the door closed keep all the you want to keep the drafts down to a minimum and see I've got this thing set at 98 I need to put it down uh, so that it starts to heat up and get this thing uh, pre-warmed here for the arrival of the chicks. Try not to stay in here for more than two weeks. We try and get them out on pasture as soon as possible. I want that manure outside. I uh, want them in the fresh air. But brooding here, there's really a, there's really an art uh, to that in the beginning. Um, there is a temperature chart out there in one of Joel Salatin's uh, Pastured Poultry for Profits, I think is his book that has a temperature chart. We follow that to a T. Chicks are here. Hey, you guys are doing a good job. Hold Can't on. believe it, but there are a hundred packed in there. Come on down this way. Okay, yeah, go ahead and set them down. And what we wanna do is, as you guys know the drill, you wanna just pick them up one at a time and dip their beak in the water and then let them go into the brooder. Get one. Let's see what they look like. Oh, look at them. Oh my goodness. All right. Okay, 103 chicks here, popping out on the other side now. So we'll put some uh, feed down, and uh, these guys are good to go. I do add a little bit of a vitamin stress pack here in the water for the first few days. Vital hatchery sells this, just an electrolyte mineral supplement. Uh, I do think that helps. Justin Rhodes uh, has a magic water recipe you can find it online garlic uh, i believe honey uh, maybe some apple cider vinegar something like that he's got that look for that magic water we've done that in the past uh, the electrolytes just a bit more convenient for us here with a hundred of these and uh feed let's talk about feed okay in terms of feed i love our feed manufacturer kraut creek non-gmo feed this is great stuff. We feed our layers this. Uh, this is the chick starter that we're using here. 21% uh, protein, 
Now I feed the chick starter, this 21% I'm gonna feed for all two weeks that they're in the brooder. And then I switch over to this 18% uh, grower. And uh, while they're in the brooder, it is a full feed. I put out all that they want and I usually go through two 50 pound bags here. I usually go through about 100 pounds uh, in those first two weeks. And then they go out on pasture and that's when I'm feeding this 18% here. You, you really, you don't wanna mess around with Cornish cross birds and trying to go light on feed. You, you just, you don't wanna do it. And um, you know, I will uh, later on, if we do another video here, uh, when we're out on the pasture, I can put out our feed schedule. So we have an actual feed schedule. I, I meter out the pounds every day that I give to them. And that produces a four and a half, right around a four and a half pound chicken for us at right about nine weeks old or 63 days. So kind of have done this a few times before and kept uh, data uh, on our process here. And uh, I'm looking for about a four and a half pound bird. You go much bigger than that and people really don't want to pay for it and uh, much lighter. And it's, it's kind of hard to feed a family with one meal. So uh, about a four and a half pound bird, 21% in the beginning, 18% through the season. And uh, like I say, potentially we will, if there's enough interest, we'll put out a, uh, our feed schedule when we get these things out into the pasture in the chicken tractor. Okay, checking back in here a couple hours later. You know, one way you can tell if they're too hot or too cold and how they're doing on temperature is if they are huddled together, uh, much like that, then they're too cold. So I'm gonna up this uh, even just a little bit more. And then when I see them, uh, start to spread out more. I'll know that I've got that. I've got that temperature right. Okay, I can't believe I did this. I forgot to put out the feeders. <laughs> yeah, so these are our feeders. We keep one on each end with the waters, and uh, obviously you don't want the chicks eating out of their manure there. So initially, it's fine to put down on the ground. When we move out into the pasture, I do put feed right down on the pasture on the ground. And uh, we do that because it's right after we make our move in the morning. So it's fresh grass, hasn't been manured on. And so I do that outside, also do that with our layers. But uh, for these guys, especially when they're in here, uh, I like to use a feeder. So we'll get this filled up. So in Ohio here, we have a 1,000 bird exemption. Uh, as long as I sell direct off the farm, we can sell up to 1,000 birds. This is a profitable enterprise for us, but it's one that I believe in. I believe it brings health uh, to my family and to the folks who purchase uh, these chickens. A couple things though, it's not cheap. Uh, feed is expensive and we do buy all of our feed. I'm a believer in the non-GMO feed, it's a great quality. And you know, the proof is really in the pudding. Uh, mm. It's in the feedback that we get from, from the consumer. And uh, you know, we've got some pretty regular customers around here that uh, they have great things to say about this chicken. The other thing is it takes, it takes a special consumer. So you're looking for someone who not only is willing to pay more for high quality meat, but it's somebody who is willing to uh, cook with a whole bird. You know, I can't piece out chicken and sell off the farm. I'm not allowed to do that, but I can sell the whole birds. And so finding that uh, consumer, uh, you know, they're out there. They're out there and uh, just takes a little bit of effort to connect with those folks. Customers who appreciate uh, your product and appreciate what you're doing. I like, again, the multifaceted approach though, making great meat, making great pasture. Uh, it all works together. Thanks for watching and uh, busy time of the year. So we will be back soon. Take care.